in the piano Like he was borrowing a dirty book He bit a hole in his big bottom lip And gave his very best little boy look And it was a song with a topical verse Which I'm afraid he then proceeded to sing it's nearly three years since Elvis Costello's last album, and 12 years since he arrived in the vanguard of intelligent punk. Costello has always had a restless need to reinvent himself and his music. He was the angry young man on his debut album, My Aim Is True. He enjoyed pop stardom with Oliver's Army. Don't start the talking. On the Get Happy album, he reworked Stax and Motown. Some things you never get used to, even though you're feeling like another man. And more recently, on King of America, he produced an economical, stripped-down sound. Now with a new album, Spike the Beloved Entertainer, Costello has moved away from intensely personal songs to a broader examination of the world around him. For the recordings, Costello handpicked a diverse range of musicians to provide precise musical settings for his most adventurous lyrics to date. In some quarters, Spike has been hailed as Costello's masterpiece. Behind the comic grease paint, the attitude is as pointed and as passionate as ever. Well, the Beloved Entertainer was the original title for the, for the record. I, I had this image of this Beloved Entertainer, which I, I don't know whether there's a, a picture of the Beloved Entertainer in captivity, as we see him now, hung up on the wall. That's kind of what the record companies do now. They go out and shoot their artists and hang them on like a trophy in the boardroom, you know. And, and, I'm, and Spike is portrayed as a trophy on the boardroom wall. Uh, it, it really doesn't have any other significance. The, uh, the beloved entertainer, on the other hand, is a character I think we're all familiar with. And he makes various sort of appearances in a couple of the songs on the record. Uh, he's the kind of guy that comes out and you feel like you've known him a thousand years when he's been on stage about five minutes, you know, and, and I, think, I think people will recognize him in, the, in, in some of the songs. I wish you'd known me when I was alive crowd would hoot and holler for more I wore a drunk's red nose for applause Oh yes, I was a comical priest With a joke for the flock And a hand up your fleece Drool in the drink and the lipstick and grease paint Down the cardboard front of my 
dirty dark color Now I'm dead, now I'm dead, now I'm dead, now I'm dead And I'm going on to meet my reward I was scared, I was scared, I was scared, I was scared He might have never heard God's coming So there he was on a waterbed Drinking a cola of a mystery brand Reading an airport novelette Listening to Andrew Lloyd Webber's Requiem He said before it had really begun I prefer the water I've been wading through all of this unbelievable junk and wondering if I should have given the world to the monkeys. Now I am dead, now I am dead. Scared, are you scared? Are you scared? Are you scared? You might have never heard but God's coming. I'm gonna take a little trip down paradise's endless shores. They say that the trap. The mind till you can't get your head out of doors. I'm sitting here on the top of the world. I hang around in the darkest night Until each beast has gone to bed And then I say, God bless And put out the light While you lie in the dark Afraid to breathe And you're begging your promise and you bargain and you plea Sometimes you confuse me with Santa Claus It's the big white beard I suppose I'm going up to the pole Where you folks die a cold I might be gone for a while If you need me I'm dead, now I'm dead, now I'm dead, now I'm dead And you're all going on to meet your reward Are you scared, are you scared, are you scared, are you scared You might have never heard the God's coming Listening to the new album, you appear to have changed your approach both lyrically and musically. The musical arrangements are often very intricate, and we'll come on to talk about them, but it seems to me that the lyrics are more direct and less equivocal than ever before. Would that be oversimplistic? Um, possibly that's just the way it appears to, to yourself or to somebody else, but um, uh, I, I think it's, everything changed. You change as a person, you change in your approach. You listen to different music, it has an influence, in, an influence on you. You maybe can't hear that influence in the music, but your attitude to music changes. Um, I think uh, over the last four years or something, I've written much simpler songs, mm. much easier to understand songs, and I've left behind some of the trickier use of words that didn't necessarily always say more. I'll defend some of the stuff that I got criticized for where I thought I turn a phrase 
did do its job, but the words are supposed to carry a meaning, and if they just become uh, party tricks, then they don't really serve that purpose. And I don't think there's anything that amazing about what I was doing with words. I think it, mm. it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a race of pygmies, really, that, that you, you know, uh, lyric writers these days. So um, it, it, it isn't a tremendous amount to be better than. You know, all of these things, the way in which we describe them, make them sound much more important or as if they're, you know, they're, they're like a bolt of lightning hitting mm. you or something. And they're, they're, they're much more fun. There's a lot more fun to writing. Sometimes a song, you'll be working with the guitar and the song will appear and it'll be there before you realize you've been working at it. Sometimes I'll be listening to the radio and a quite mundane phrase will leap out as if it was beautiful poetry. And maybe that's, if it's a talent, it's more like a, a curse uh, sometimes to just be able to hear um, something in a, a quite mundane phrase that'll spark your imagination, gets you thinking about something. Or other times it'll be the middle of the night and you'll wake up or I'll be walking down the road and as far away from a guitar or a tape recorder as possible and suddenly I'll start getting ideas. It's, it, it is a little bit like being possessed, but it's not unpleasant. <laughs> is there anything that you could illustrate that with um, from the new album, for example? A, mun um, a mundane phrase or...? A munda oh, a mundane phrase coming out. Well, it isn't a mundane phrase, it's a beautiful phrase, but um, I was watching a program about uh, jungle or something and the, you know the way they talk in those things and they have these beautiful pictures and they're obliged to have somebody saying something mm. and uh, this guy said and this butterfly appears to drink this turtle's tears and, and I thought that was a lovely uh, thing to say it was a beautiful image and the butterfly was hovering over this uh, thing and then, and then it went down and got some bugs off a, off a dead monkey that was lying in the floor of the jungle and uh, it said uh, and it feeds on the dead monkey's hand now it doesn't actually eat the monkey's hand now in the in the song deep dark truthful mirror i had this catalog of, of, of disaster this person that won't go home it doesn't know how to it, it is obsessed and it's a very strange mysterious song that i, I tried to portray mm -hmm. like a deranged person's mind or, or the, the way you, your mind can get in yourself and in the last verse of the song um, I had a lot of different images unconnected, kind of like a, a series of delusions, and suddenly I found a place for these two things that I'd noted. Mm. Now, you so know, the, the original scriptwriter might have, might, have, might have thought of them as poetry, mm. and well, here they found their way into my song, and now he can come and claim his royalties from me. Mm. He goes, A stripping puppet on a liquid stick Gets into it pretty thick a butterfly drinks a turtle's tears But how do you know he really needs it? Cause a butterfly feeds on a dead monkey's hand Jesus wept, he felt abandoned You're spellbound, baby, there's no doubt in that Did you ever see a stare like a Persian cat? The same eyes same lips, the same light from head on trips. Deep dark, deep dark truth for mirror. Deep dark, deep dark truth for mirror. Deep dark, deep dark truth for mirror. When it comes to songwriting, you've always acknowledged your debts, and there have been distinct borrowings. Where have you done that? I, I, I would, you know, the, I, I had this thing for a while that I tried to get as many line, and many references to the Supremes into my songs. There was, a, <laughs> I, there's, a, there's, you know, it's only in passing. You would never know. The song Accidents Will Happen, which was a, you know, reasonably well-known song, had that you keep me hanging on in, in, in it, mm. which came from that song. And then, I, and then on the very next record, I started in one of the other songs with Some Things You Never Get Used, which is actually the title of one of their songs. Things like that. But then that's only a starting point for your thought. You then have to develop it another way. You, they put them in like quotes. If it just becomes trickery, if it's just a clever, clever thing, then again, it doesn't, it's like wordplay. It just gets on people's nerves. But there are times when it can be quite uh, fun to do. And sometimes I, maybe indulge it when I'm not um, writing something from a very personal standpoint. If I'm asked to write a song for a reason, I was asked to write a song uh, for a film once and they wanted a very romantic song about a girl um, considering 
all her options in life. And I took two songs that I really like and uh, tried to uh, basically rewrite them. So you how's know? it work? Uh, uh, I had to go to the piano. I can't play either of them or any of them very well. So that song, True Love by Cole Porter, it, it, mm -hmm. it, I don't even know the real changes, but it's something like... <laughs> special computer driven piano so there's that melody there and then uh, I love that song uh, uh, Scarlet Ribbons there it goes uh, I won't have to as you can see I don't know these songs very well so I couldn't have been stealing from them that well I put them all together and, and put them together. all together. <laughs> this is what you guys are. Looking down from all of this on everything I'll ever miss. Everything I ever wanted is perfectly matched and beautifully appointed. But like a poor child at Christmas, Who's tricked and deceived You can make any promise in the world Not one can be believed Through the cellophane windows Of a warm winter stove I see the ice on my fingers and a look that I love But there's one thing for certain I'll never beg, borrow or crawl If you can't give me what I want I'm having it all If you can't give me what I want I'm having it all. And that song was for absolute beginners. And they didn't use it. They didn't use it. Who was going to be singing it? Patsy Kensit, oh. my old schoolmate. The song Let Him Dangle, where did the inspiration for that come from? Well, the story, of course, it happened before I was born. The case happened. The case of Bentley and Craig happened before I was born, so... But what, it was what passed... was the case of Bentley and Craig? Well, the, the, briefly, the, as I understand it, two young tearaways were cornered by the police during, during a robbery. One was under arrest, that was Bentley, and he shouted to his friend to let him have it. Now, the younger man had the gun, and the interpretation placed on it by the prosecution was that he intended to incite him to fire the gun, which is what he did, and shot the policeman dead. When they came to trial, they were both found guilty, but because Chris Craig was underage, he couldn't be hanged, so they hanged Bentley, even though he had actually been in custody at the time of the murder, because they said he incited the man to do it through, through his words. And then on an occasion a few years ago, I read a, uh, an, an interview with, with uh, Derek Bentley's sister, and some of the things, some of the, just the personal things she said about it were so heartbreaking in a, in a real way, not in some sentimental way. They were so brutal, some of the things that she said, because uh, she is still trying to get some kind of acknowledgement that maybe a mistake was mm. made or some kind of apology or a, uh, a re what, what's the word, a pardon Retraction. of some kind. Yeah. How can you retract somebody, killing mm. somebody, you can't take it back. That's the whole problem. It's an unembellished, unadorned song, apart from some comment that I make that I, I would say you have to have in those story songs, it comes from a sort of tradition of story songs, 
where you tell the story and then you almost say, and the moral of this story mm. is. And, and there's a lot of songs like that. And for a long time I resisted doing those, cause, mainly because I figured they'd been done to death. But this seemed the right form for this song. This just to be technical, mm. to get away from the actual subject for one second, to step back at how to say it, was just to put this one little comment in it, that it, uh, at the middle and the end of the song. So that would be like your two little comments on this story to bring it up to date in one respect. That if killing anybody is a terrible crime, why does this bloodthirsty chorus come around from time to time? And then in the last verse, it just comments a little bit on the way in which this whole debate seems sometimes to be manipulated solely for its political merits. If mm. that's, the, that's probably not the right word. The merit or the power of distraction that it, that it has. Bentley said to Craig, let him have it, Chris. They still don't know today just what he meant by this. Craig fired the pistol but was too young to swing. So the police took Bentley and the very next thing. Let him dangle, let him dangle. Let him dangle, let him dangle. had surrendered he was under arrest when he gave chris craig that fatal request craig shot in the miles he took bentley's word the prosecution claimed as they charged him with murder let him dangle let him dangle let him dangle let him dangle they say Derek Bentley was easily led Well, what's that to the woman that just sitting in my house with? No guilty was the verdict And Craig had shot him dead The gallows were for Bentley And still she never said Let him dangle Let him dangle Do 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 When there's a murder in the kitchen that is brutal and strange If killing anybody is a terrible crime Why does this bloodthirsty chorus come round from time to time? Let him dangle Not many people thought that Bentley would hang But the word never came the phone never rang Outside ones were prison There was horror and hate As the hangman shook Bentley's hand To calculate his weight Let him dangle Let him dangle Let him dangle Let him dangle well, it's hard to imagine this, the times that have changed When there's a murder in the kitchen that is brutal and strange If killing anybody is a terrible crime Why does this bloodthirsty chorus come round from time to time? state to society murder bring back the nooses always heard whenever those swine are under attack but it won't make you even it won't bring him back let him dangle let him dangle let him dangle let him dangle. Let him dangle. 
dangle, let him dangle. Do 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 do. Let him dangle, let him dangle. Do 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 do. Sing it up. What about someone like Paul McCartney, who you work with, you collaborate with on two tracks on this album? Obviously, you were very familiar with his oeuvre when you came to work with him. How familiar was he with yours? Um, my oeuvre. Your oeuvre. <laughs> my oeuvre. Um, I, I, I really don't know. I didn't ask him that question. We were more concerned with the job in hand, which was to write some songs. I came along with a couple of songs which I had started work on. You were pr primarily brought in to work on his album, and are yeah. these two songs that appear on your album a byproduct of that? Not really a byproduct. I, I took them as insurance uh, against us just being in the room and staring at each other and going, what do we do now? Um, I had some songs I was underway with. Um, for instance, I got this, I just happened to have this book. <laughs> now, I brought this along. Pads, uh, Paws and you Claws. See that? Pads, Paws and Claws. And it does sound like a good rock and roll kind of song title. And not like a big time, you know, terribly profound thought it's just it's, it, it sparks off your imagination some sort of thought so I'd started I had a little can I do this yeah. I, I had this I had this very guitar this one given to me by George Formby <laughs> and I had this riff which is just kind of uh, it's just kind of uh, you know people know that riff they've heard it forever it's so you know, simple it's like uh, baby please don't go you know and, and John Lee Hooker and all this stuff and I had this much of a, of a song written. Uh, she's a feline tormentor, not any fault of a wife, with a drunk town of Mandy, leads her a miserable life. The wind is full of that beer champagne, she pats paws, pats paws and claws. And if you should wake up in some terrible dive, we don't know if it's so so, but it's so surprised it's alive. Come on, little honey, let me honey your heart. She pats paws, pats paws and claws. So I had that much of it, which could have gone on and on and on like that and just been riffing on that thing and would have been just fun. And so I, I, I got this song out while we were kind of feeling our way out and, and um, Mr. McCartney said, uh, well, that's all very well, this pads pause. It's a catchy sort of little hook, but it doesn't really explain anywhere what it means by that. It, it, it's, it's just cute sounding, and you, you sort of establish these two people, and they're, they're sort of fighting back and forward. He goes out in the town, she's waiting for him with a rolling pin. It's kind of like an Andy Cap cartoon or something. He said, what you need to do is literally just go, she pads and explain, she pulls, you know, or he pulls, and, and really looked at it really like, it sounds kind of cold, but in the long run, we wrote a bridge of the song which goes, uh, She pads, pads around the bedroom, practicing ways to flirt. He pours, pours another drink and anything in a skirt. Anything wearing a necklace. He thinks I'm claws scratching his back. He's going out there, he's not coming back. Spider leg fingers sharpen wherever he strays. And she carries a bird purse with all of a woman who weighs. But while he's drinking her spray, she knows that he never was there. She could be in pictures, but she wasn't all covered in fur. But he's coming home now, and here's the surprise. You wouldn't believe the lies that he tries. She cut him down. Favorite size. She bats, balls, bats, balls, and claws. She bats, balls, bats, balls, and claws. So we're back to the original thing, you know. And 
That's it. That was one song. Quick. Was it incredibly five, intimidating sitting down? Five minutes and there you go. You know, <laughs> sitting down with him. You were in the Beatles fan club when you were eleven, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Who was your favourite Beatle? Oh, I'm not saying. <laughs> I think, think we understand what that means. Um, no. <laughs> um, the one that used to play drums when Ringo was sick. <laughs> the other song that um, you worked on together, Veronica, is going to be the single. Mm. How did that uh, come about? Well, exactly the same way. I, I, I had got to about the same stage of writing it and we just literally said, what, where does it need to go now? I wanted to write this song about uh, an old person sitting there and appearing to be completely uh, gone, as we say, but really coming and going and sort of sometimes be, being completely lucid, but not making it a sentimental song. I wanted it to be sort of defiant and kind of happy as if it was about a very young girl who was just starting out her life. Because sometimes when you talk to older people, they kind of, they shoot back to something that happened that was very important to them 30 years ago, and then they shoot forward again. And, it, and there's something, sometimes it's quite magical, sometimes it's quite frightening. I, I, I really took a lot of it from when I was talking to my grandmother, and I went, I went to visit her in the last few years of her life. And, and so it's like a, a love song in a way for her, but written like as if it was about a young girl. And, and therefore the pop music thing bears that up now. People will hear the song and maybe just say, oh yeah, it's about this young girl, Veronica. And then you listen a little bit more. I'm not making any big point, it's just a little bit of hope. And it's a, like I say, a love song from, from me, you know. Um, and that's really all I can, uh, I can say about it. To have a carefree mind of her own And a delicate look in her eyes These days I'm afraid she's not even sure If her name is Veronica Um, underplayed or downplayed your abilities as an instrumentalist and you build yourself as a little hands of concrete on uh, uh, in, with reference to your guitar playing on one LP. Um, is it false modesty or do you seriously feel no, that you I have am, limitations I'm really, I'm really as a really a guitarist? clumsy guitar player yeah. but I have a certain thing that um, is unique that because I'm so clumsy really <laughs> <laughs> and I hit it I hit the guitar very hard when I play the guitar it seems like it's attached to my jaw so if I'm singing loud I hit the guitar harder and break strings and and you know all the stuff that a proper trained player would never ever do uh, but uh, you know it's a joke obviously but I'm, I don't think it's being falsely modest because I uh, if you have very limited technique you find exactly the notes that you want and they're the ones that are important is there one track on the album who, uh, where you're particularly proud of your guitar playing baby plays around springs to mind um, I think that's that that does the job I mean there's a song that could um, quite easily have uh, been done with a, a, a sort of uh, monochromic uh, cocktail lounge sort of uh, atmosphere but unfortunately uh, the very clumsy hands of some of the fake jazz exponents of today have um, destroyed that vocabulary for a lot of pop listeners they hear uh, a smoky sort of saxophone, a bit of string bass, and they think they're going to hear Sade record, you know? Um, consequently, you have to look for a new way to present the song, so I just got an acoustic guitar and played the changes on that. It wasn't my song to begin with, it was one I was particularly interested in getting right, because it's my wife's song. I went out to buy a newspaper, and when I came back, she had written this song, sung it into a tape recorder, and she doesn't play any chordal instruments, she plays bass, so I, I uh, had to work out the changes, so then, I was really conscious of the fact that we didn't want to make a cliché out of this song because I thought it was a simple 
uh, a simple song that just wanted to be told in a very straightforward, honest way. It's not open to discussion anymore She's out again tonight And I'm alone once more She's all I have worth waiting for But baby plays around And so it seems I've always been the last to know To hold on to that girl I had to let her go I wish to God I didn't love her so Cause baby plays around I try to be strong Hold on to my She doesn't even know it's wrong How much I hurt inside And heaven knows I've tried But baby plays around Just a play thing It's hard to reconcile The facts I'm facing it's not open to discussion anymore She walks those shiny streets I walk the worn-out floor She's all I have worth living for But baby, please On Spike, you've used musicians from all around the world, and one of the most distinctive sounds comes from the Irish musicians. How did you come to be working with them? Well, I, as I explained before, I was living in Dublin for three months uh, while my wife, Cot, was making this film, The Courier, and I was working on the music and writing some songs. And I got a phone call one day from a, a man called Donald Lunny, who's a, a great musician and has played in many different bands in, in, in traditional music and traditional combined with other things. Uh, and he's a, a brilliant musician and arranger. And he was doing a television program where he had assembled a, a lineup of players, some of whom had played together before, and some of whom were playing together for the first time. And he invited me to come and um, perform on the show. And they had a lineup of uh, fiddle and pipes, flute, himself on bazooki, myself on acoustic guitar, another acoustic guitar player, and some percussionists. And we very hurriedly arranged. Um, three songs, one of which I'd recorded before, and two new songs, which were uh, Let Him Dangle and Any King Shilling. And we did them on the show, and, and, and I was uh, very pleased with the results, considering the amount of preparation we had. So it gave me um, almost a trial run at hearing the, those sounds. Please don't put I don't know 
Literally, do you mean the song Tramp the Dirt Down? Perhaps you'd better explain to whom it's directed and what the thought was behind the song. Well, I'm not inclined to describe the song line by line. I think it'd diminish it. I'd rather just sing it. But um, some of the things came from observations during the last election. And one particular line which I would recite is the bridge of the song which says when England was the whore of the world Margaret was her madam and the future looked as bright and as clear as the black tarmac Adam and that's the way I, I think it is and it contemplates her demise in a quite brutal way um, the setting of that song is probably the most beautiful on the album the most melodious and yet as you say the, the sentiment behind the song is intensely ugly what was the um, thinking behind putting the uh, that sentiment to that setting? Well, I, when I first wrote it, I, I wrote it in straight out of my head type of... very much just appeared in ten minutes. And, and then later I, I added a little bit of, to the lyrics. But um, it was very aggressive in, in, in just with acoustic guitar, the way I'd play it solo, it wouldn't be too pretty, it wouldn't have the same delicacy. And uh, the intensity of the feeling about it makes makes you instinctively lean towards the more out performance but the melody doesn't really um, insist upon that it will stand up to it mm. but it but it also will stand up to a more a sadder more contemplative treatment and particularly in in case of the instrumentation the way I play it on the guitar is kind of like very harsh this is a pretty harsh sounding acoustic guitar it's an old instrument that has a clanky sort of sound. If you, the way we had it arranged was uh, with an, a very, very delicately played a, a acoustic guitar, which Donald only played in bazooki. And then pipes and fiddle came in a, as a harmony supporting the chorus. And I suddenly started to approach the song with much m more sadness. So instead of trying to express my contempt and anger that was already written mm. in the song by trying to match every word with a harsh delivery, I went the other way and had a, tried to just sing the song truthfully and not so maybe theatrically as that might, uh, might have appeared, you know? Less of a protest song. Yeah, also there is something to consider. This is the reaction, action, reaction chain, is that people know that, that mannerism. They, they know it from Bob Dylan, they know it from Billy Bragg. They recognise it and immediately mm. react and they're in a frame of mind before they've heard a single thing you have to say. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more ingenious, you know? first thing to say about what they what are self-consciously defined as political songs is if you say it's subversive it isn't subversive you know and uh, th there's nothing subversive about the song it straight out says what it has to say um, but the way of saying it um, determines on how many people listen to the end does it sadden you that you're reduced to making that kind of statement um, because you don't strike me as a particularly violent person it's just a question of what it draw, draws out in you. I think everybody's capable of the most monstrous violence. She seems like a perfectly reasonable person. You know, in some manifestations, she certainly looks fairly benign. She's a middle-aged woman with a hair like candy floss, but she does some of the most monstrous things and, and shows not just two faces, but seems like any face that suits her at the time and then tells you that it's a completely honest way to be. And I just... Uh, can't find any words that are, uh, portray my contempt strong enough. And I'm not, I'm th you know, I, I, I'm not uh, some little kid that they can say, there, there now, you're just these young little teenagers who are 
having your moment of protest. I'm, I'm a man, I'm 35 years old, and I'm fucking sick of it, you know, of what's going on in this country. I saw a newspaper picture from the political campaign. A woman was kissing a child who was obviously in pain. She spills with compassion. It's that young child's face in her hands she grips Can you imagine all that greed And avarice coming down on that child's lips Well, I hope I don't die too soon I pray the Lord my soul to save Yes, I'll be a good boy I'm trying so hard to be Because there's one thing I know I'd like to live long enough to save her It's way Your soul to keep 
I think I'll be going before we fold our arms and start to weep. I never thought for a moment that human life could be so cheap. But Dead.